So, welcome everybody. Um, I'm glad to welcome you to this seminar, Impact, Traders and Life, which is given by Anja Lusiak from the Institute of Geological Sciences of the Polish Academy of Sciences. Anja has done her PhD studies in Vienna in the group of Christian Köbel. Then um, she moved to the University of Exeter where she did uh, quite a bit of work on impact craters, actually also on the Kali crater in uh, Estonia, where her team was successful in dating the impact crater, which more or less gave a huge input on a discussion which has been going on for decades about the age of this crater. And then all started Polish. thanks to Paul. <laughs> yeah. The, and his uh, summer school that uh, he organized in 2013, yeah. was it? 2013, it was an outcome of the summer school. A team was formed to date this calligator and it was successful. So you see that also student projects coming from training events can lead to um, very important contributions to science. But now I will conclude my presentation and I will leave the floor to Anja, who will be giving you an overview about the subject impact craters and life. Thank you. And Bye -bye. <laughs> I will be also talking about death. Uh, okay, uh, if you will have uh, any questions uh, afterwards, uh, just drop me an email or hopefully you will have enough time to talk uh, afterwards. Um, during my talk, I will, I'm going to hopefully introduce you to the most important geological process that you have never learned about uh, at school or to some, to that matter, uh, during uh, a normal geological education, uh, which is pretty bad, I would say. So hopefully within the next um, hour, I will be able to uh, explain to you what I have learned uh, within the last 10 years. <laughs> Uh, hopefully it will work. Um, the presentation will be divided into two different sections. First one uh, will be the introduction into uh, impact cratering. Uh, so where does it happen? How does it happen? How often and what are the effects of uh, such events? Uh, it, it's mostly designed to introduce people who are not impact scientists to, to the topic. So if you are an impact scientist, sorry, uh, to be quite basic for you, but <laughs> there's a lot of uh, people that uh, do not uh, are not accustomed to this uh, to this topic. Uh, second section of my presentation will be the uh, influence of impact cratering uh, on the development of life uh, and also killing of life, which is actually much more closer to my heart uh, because this is what I study. Um, okay, the first. And the most important thing to know is that there is a spy space material falling down on Earth all the time. And in fact, it's quite a lot of it. It's uh, as much every day uh, on Earth, we have about 1000 tons of new materials, which is about equ equivalent to uh, a, a great blue whale falling down on us every day. Of course, this great blue whale is falling mostly in very, very small pieces. Um, so most of here you can see a plot of uh, the material that uh, showing the crater formation frequency or rather uh, pieces frequency of uh, different pieces falling down on Earth. Uh, here is a really small pieces like smaller even than the size of a, a grain of sand uh, and here we are in the section where there is the um, large chunks of planetary material uh, that are able to form uh, impact craters uh, and uh, as you can see most of this uh, those uh, pieces uh, as you can see because it's a log log uh, scale, uh, mass versus uh, frequency. Um, most of this material falls down on us as very small pieces, which is good <laughs> because they are not dangerous for us. Uh, actually, they can be pretty uh, 
useful. Can I please ask you to mute your um, uh, recording uh, device uh, because I can hear someone speaking. <laughs> Sorry. Please check if you are muted. Okay, let's go further away. So, in conclusion, um, material is falling down on Earth uh, all the time. Most of it is quite small. Uh, however, there are also places on Earth where larger pieces of space rocks have fallen. Uh, currently, we know about uh, 200 of them, so it's not so much as for quite a large um, planet. Uh, they are marked here with those uh, white dots that you can see. Uh, the largest of those craters and one of the oldest, not the oldest, uh, is Redaport. It's about, or it used to be about 300 kilometers in diameter. It was found two billion years ago. And the youngest one uh, was formed in only in 2007. Uh, it was uh, only 13 meters in diameter. Uh, and uh, you cannot find it anymore because it was already destroyed uh, in Caracas, uh, Peru. So there's a very large uh, range of possible um, features that have the same um, origin, uh, mainly the um, uh, being uh, formed in the collision of uh, Earth with other planetary body. And we, if as I said, depending on the size of those impactors, they can have very different effects on our own planet. So if you have uh, those really small ones uh, that are about the size of the um, grain of uh, sand up to a couple of centimeters in diameter, they all burn down in the atmosphere and the only thing that we can uh, see uh, left after them uh, are the shooting stars and of course uh, sometimes quite interesting effects in the uh, atmosphere uh, where those um, this rocky material <laughs> uh, is deposited. So those those are the effects of those small bodies. Uh, and those, as I said, are happening all the time. Um, sometimes we have uh, those uh, meteor showers where uh, they are particularly common, but, but this is happening all the time. If we have those slightly larger pieces of rocks, uh, like about a meter in diameter, they are falling on Earth uh, and most of it is uh, destroyed during the atmospheric passage, but parts of it can actually survive and can be found uh, in the form of a meteorite. Uh, here you can see a piece of rock that fallen down uh, on the USA uh, 1992, and those types of events are happening a couple of times a year. Um, we do not find all of those uh, meteorites, because obviously sometimes they, they are happening over inhabited uh, areas or more importantly over oceans, but, but there are still quite a lot of meteorites that are left uh, for us to study, for example. If the body was bigger, uh, this can start to be more dangerous to humans and uh, maybe some unlucky uh, animals as well, uh, which was very nicely uh, showed to us by the event of 2013 over Chelabinsk when about 20 meter in diameter uh, asteroid uh, exploded and injured about 1,500 people. We should expect this size of uh, event a uh, couple of times every uh, millennia, I would say. Uh, larger uh, events such as the Tunguska, uh, which was probably made, it's still unclear, but it was probably made by uh, uh, something that was uh, 50 meters in diameter uh, and exploded over a um, quite empty uh, site in uh, Siberia. Uh, it flooded uh, down a zone of about uh, 25 kilometers from the um, from the point of uh, explosion or maximal uh, maximal blast, uh, and this size of the uh, event is happening uh, every uh, couple of hundreds of years. Uh, 
interestingly, this thing does not leave any long lasting traces. Uh, so it, it's much harder to study. Uh, if the impactor was made from something else, but uh, then the one uh, that made Tunguska event, but was about the same size, uh, we can end up with a hole in the ground uh, that is about one kilometer in diameter. Uh, this is the case for Meteor Crater that is uh, in USA. Uh, and uh, it was made by an about 50 to 100 meter in diameter uh, iron meteorite. And of course, everyone knows uh, about the Chick Sloop, uh, which is on this um, largest end of the um, of the spectrum, uh, which is uh, used to be about before it hit the Earth was about uh, 10 kilometers in, in diameter, and those events are happening uh, every um, couple of tens uh, millions of years. So, but why quite small pieces of rocks hitting the Earth are uh, producing such gigantic effects, like in case of Chick Sloop, not only formation of this uh, crater that was uh, that is about 170 kilometers in diameter, but also uh, inducing the global um, mass uh, uh, massive deadly event uh, that uh, happened uh, and uh, ended the era of dinosaurs. Well, it's all about the kinetic energy. So the crater size uh, depends uh, directly on the kinetic energy, which is dependent on mass and velocity. Uh, and But it's the velocity section is more important. The masses of the uh, of pieces of rocks, space rocks that are hitting the Earth can be, as I said, from less than the grain of um, of sand to you know thousand millions of tons um, and to some extent it also depends on the density of the particle that is impacting the earth so the uh, iron meteorites uh, are about uh, eight uh, um, grams per centimeters cubed uh, and the rocky impactors that are much less dense uh, but the thing that is actually important is the velocity mostly because it's uh, the, the kinetic energy depends on the squared root of the uh, velocity and the velocities are really, really gigantic. Uh, the average velocity with which a uh, space rock is hitting the Earth before um, before entering the atmosphere is about 20 uh, kilometers per second. Uh, and that's a lot of speed. That's a lot of energy. So here you can see the uh, distance traveled in one second by different uh, um, objects. <laughs> Let's call them this way. Uh, and the velocities that uh, this is uh, related to. So, for example, uh, if we have a human that is uh, the, the fastest human in, in the world, uh, within a second, he can travel up to Come on, up to 11 meters, not more than that. The fastest car can travel up to 330 meters. The train, uh, the planes that are kind of regular planes, uh, about one kilometer. Uh, the rocket, the fastest rocket that we ever produced, uh, was able to, after, you know, after it was already going quite quickly, uh, it was able to uh, travel about 10 kilometers uh, within one second. And quite normal average asteroid is traveling 20 kilometers per second. Um, this is enormous amount of energy. And because of that, this is inducing a lot of different changes that can be only compared to an explosion of a very high uh, energy bomb. Because uh, here you will see um, a numerical modeling result that is showing that um, what is happening when an asteroid marked with red here uh, is colliding with the uh, surface of air uh, of Earth, um, and the so first within like a split of a second, uh, entire uh, like. The entire uh, kinetic kine, uh, kine, 
energy of speed of this body that as we already discussed uh, discussed is very very quick uh, is being transferred into different types of energies just because the the body have collided with something else and cannot move anywhere uh, because of that we have uh, in one uh, split of a second uh, uh, ginormous amount of energy that is being released to the environment. Uh, part of this energy is used to um, dig out this um, transient cavity that later will become an impact crater or eject material from this uh, area. And it's also important to note that, especially in those larger impact craters, practically entire uh, impactor is being completely uh, damaged and not much survives. And if the impactor was not so big uh, on Earth, I would say, you know, a couple of hundreds of meters, um, we would, that would be more or less the end. We would end up uh, that, of course, the ejecta that was uh, ejected into the Earth, uh, into the atmosphere would land on the surface, but we would end up with the simple crater like one visible here. Uh, it, it looks like a ball. Um, there is not much uh, for, for that to say. However, if it's a large impact crater, the depth of the transient cavity is such, as you can see here, uh, it was uh, for the impactor about five kilometers in diameter, it was uh, about uh, minus about 20 kilometers depth of, of a hole in the ground. The rocks that are around it have not enough strength to actually keep it in this state. And because of that, uh, it for a short, short amount of time, it behaves kind of like a fluid and uh, bumps back uh, up. Uh, as a result, we the largest impact craters do not have this characteristic ball shape, but they are uh, more complex and they often use uh, look like the uh, concentric set of mountains uh, that are formed during one moment. Uh, here you can see the Orientale Basin, which is one of the largest basins uh, on the surface uh, of the moon. So because of all of that, uh, especially the amount of energy that is being released in a, a split second, uh, this hole in the ground, this crater in Arizona that is about 1.2 kilometers in diameter uh, and more than 200 meters deep was formed by a collision with only 50 meters of an iron meteorite. What is also important is to remember that all the rocks that are within the um, within, within the zone, uh, very close to the point of impact, are affected by the impact itself. Because it's not only that the rocks are being uh, physically moved from one place to another in order to form the, the crater, but also they are, uh, they are melted. Uh, part of that, if the impactor is large enough, can uh, even uh, turn into plasma. Uh, a large section of the rock is shock metamorphosed, which uh, I'm going to cover in a second. Uh, and in general, this one um, collision is forming a set of different properties of rocks and minerals that have been affected. So uh, it's also very important to uh, understand that the normal crustal metamorphism, so all the metamorphic rocks that we can find uh, on Earth that are formed by normal processes related to volcanism, related to plate tectonics or weathering or whatever, are here on the plot of pressure in GPAs uh, and temperature. So those are even those most extreme examples of high uh, pressure, temperature metamorphism of normal Earth. Uh, are really, really cool and not so pressurized when compared to impact cratering. The, there is a, a set of different changes that are being induced by the shock wave that is uh, propagating from the point of impact into the rocks that is changing the mineralogical properties of the rock itself. So in those lower 
uh, relatively lower as for the uh, impact cratering um, uh, shock metamorphism uh, zone. Uh, we can farm, for example, shock uh, shatter cones um, that are the only characteristic things that are actually uh, characteristic for the uh, shock uh, effects that are uh, that can be seen uh, with the naked eye. Uh, and with the increasing uh, pressure, we are also increasing the, the level of being messed up by the uh, shock metamorphism. Uh, okay, luckily for us, uh, right now there aren't so many um, objects uh, in the solar system that are able to do all those nasty things to us. Uh, however, we know for for sure that in the past there was uh, much more uh bodies uh, colliding not only with earth but also with other planetary bodies here you can see the uh, plot of time before present uh, we are here at zero uh the beginning of solar system is somewhere here uh, and here we have the cumulative uh number of craters in this case above four kilometers but it doesn't matter uh, and the they and those points here have been calculated and uh, calibrated based on the uh, results from the Apollo era uh, research and dating. And we can see that in the very beginning of the solar system, which is not very you know, surprising, uh, we had a lot of uh, impact craters being formed all the time. Uh, and then it uh, gradually, first gradually, and then quite quickly uh, decreased to the current levels. Uh, and as a result, on Earth, we have, uh, as I said, about 200 uh, places where those kind of events uh, taken place, and we can use them to study the uh, impact cratering also on the planetary, other planetary bodies. Uh, as you can see here, uh, by the way, I, I highly recommend this, uh, this paper, Schmieder and Kring 2020, uh, with a kind of update on uh, all the dating um, of, of impact or possible impact uh, structures uh, on Earth um, and, and their distribution. So if you want to know more about impact craters, uh, read, for example, this, this paper and other paper, papers that this paper is uh, citing. OK, but we are here right now to talk about the influence of impact craters on life. So let's do that. Uh, well, first of all, uh, the system uh, of uh, Earth Moon system on which we live and uh, which is uh, probably absolutely crucial for the development of at least more complicated, uh, complicated life because it stabilizes the uh, way in which uh, Earth is moving uh, around the Sun. Um, making our atmosphere uh, much more predictable and, and climate much more predictable uh, was, of course, the, the great collision that formed the uh, between the proto-Earth and the proto-Moon system uh, that probably um, have a completely uh, or in large in large section uh, melted, remelted our planet and of course the moon and created uh, this, um, this system that we uh, know right now and love. So we wouldn't be here if it wouldn't be for this particular event. But there is more. more. Uh, it's quite probable well, people are still arguing, but it's quite probable that uh, either most of or quite uh, a lot of water have been uh, delivered to Earth and other uh, inner uh, planetary systems by uh, planets uh, by uh, collisions uh, of uh, the objects that are that have been formed further away. Uh, we have this uh, snow line uh, that was. Um, that is a line that was formed uh, that that um, defines place uh, where ice either cannot be stable or can be stable uh, and since we know that on earth we have water it had to be delivered somehow to to our own planet from uh, places further away uh, from the sun uh, and based on the um, hydrogen isotopes uh, that you can see here um, 
and hydrogen isotopes properties of different planetary bodies that have been measured, uh, we can try to figure out where the water came from. So here you can see the uh, plot of for Earth, uh, the average uh, composition for Earth here, as, as well as we know it. Uh, we can see different asteroids uh, also having quite close uh, properties uh, of the uh, hydrogen isotopes to, to the Earth's ones, uh, and also other bodies like the Jupiter, Uranus, uh, and so on, uh, and the um, comets, different types of comets uh, that have high higher ratios of deuterium, deuterium uh, versus uh, hydrogen. Um, so we still don't know if our water was uh, delivered by uh, comets or by asteroids. In the past, uh, we were more thinking about uh, collisions, numerous collisions with, uh, with comets, uh, because comets do have much more water than asteroids do. However, because of those uh, more and more accumulation of data about the uh, hydrogen isotopes uh, and the similarity of uh, the uh, asteroidal uh, hydrogen isotopes ratios to Earth ones, uh, right now I think most people agree that most of the water came from the uh, collisions with uh, asteroids. Uh, another thing that we have to thank uh, the uh, impact cratering is a delivery of organic material. Uh, that was delivered by uh, meteorites, again, collisions with meteorites. Uh, for example, this is one of the most uh, studied uh, and well-known uh, piece of uh, carbonaceous chondrite, which is a type of meteorite that includes quite a lot of uh, carbon. Um, in fact, not only carbon, but uh, all of the other building blocks of uh, of life that we need. So uh, again, this particular uh, piece uh, that was measured by Yaroshevich in uh, 1971 uh, had about 2% of carbon, about 10% of water, which is quite a lot. Uh, there is also phosphorus, sulfur, and other things that are necessary to build our bodies. In fact, it's not only elements themselves that are within those uh, carbonaceous chondrites, uh, those also include quite a lot and quite complex uh, organic molecules uh, that, and more we, uh, we study them, the more uh, complex uh, molecules we find. Um, so for example, uh, I think a year ago, there was a paper uh, describing uh, some sugars that were found in um, uh, in Murchison. Uh, so th there's a lot of things that is uh, that were going on there within those rocks, uh, mostly because uh, for some time, a couple of millions of years, and those rocks uh, not only had all those uh, elements that are necessary for formation of organic uh, material, but also had quite a lot of water and temperatures that allowed uh, everything to interact and um, cook <laughs> slowly all those amazing molecules. However, when we think about the um, delivery of those organic molecules to Earth, and if potentially we could use all of those uh, complicated um, particles as they are, uh, it it's not so easy, unfortunately, because uh, as we already discussed, uh, a lot of those rocks, especially in those larger um, type of impacts, uh, are being uh, very very heavily messed up uh, by the process. So just keep that in mind. It's it was definitely delivered, especially uh, those in those smaller pieces that are being rained down on air uh, all the time uh, on Earth, on Mars, whatever. Um, but for the larger impactors, <laughs> most of the impactor is totally uh, gone, uh, vaporized, and and you know it whatever fancy things were formed uh, before it uh, it arrived uh, on on earth it's not longer in one piece 
there's still you know elements delivered so that's still good but not not the more complicated uh, material however uh, there is also something um, something else that can be induced by the uh, impact process itself uh, and i i need to uh, be very grateful to uh, to dr ferris uh, who sent me uh, the paper um, his paper about this topic uh, i highly recommend you to to read that um, it was it was discovered uh, for quite so long, and right now we discover more and more about this pro uh, this process that when the shock wave is going through the atmosphere, especially the atmosphere that is full of uh, uh, carbon um, um, elements, uh, water, nitrogen, uh, that this interaction with hot and dense plasma is uh, producing a lot of um, particles uh, that wouldn't exist without it. And then those particles are pretty good, especially when they interact with uh, some um, clay surfaces to produce very, very complicated um, particles, organic particles that can be uh, used as a building blocks of life. So the large impact craters can definitely uh, damage uh, particles that have been formed before uh, entering the at uh, atmosphere but in the same time they can be very efficient in producing uh, very complicated um, particles organic particles by the interaction of the shock uh, wave with the atmosphere and of course uh, impact craters are amazing places for to be alive if you are a you know microorganism i guess uh, first of all impact craters are creating a amazing um, set of uh, habitable niches or potentially habitable niches uh, especially because of the uh, hydrothermal systems that are being induced exactly and only because there there was a space uh, collision there so uh First of all, we have a lot of energy that is being delivered by the uh, impactor itself uh, and the uh, kinetic energy that is being uh, transformed into, per, among other ones, uh, um, among other types of energy uh, heat. Um, and we have a lot of, uh, especially in those larger impact craters, uh, impact melts that can be you know, behave as a very thick uh, layer of melted rock that can retain its heat for quite a long time. Uh, second uh, source of uh, energy that can uh, start and sustain hydro hydrothermal systems is the geothermal gradient. Um, in, especially in those larger impact craters, um, we end up with bringing a lot of uh, rocks that used to be very very deep below the surface of uh, the earth uh, to the to the surface which means that in their original position they had much higher temperature than the normal rocks that are on the surface at this place uh, because of that uh, especially the central parts of the um, large impact craters can sustain uh, the uh, the temperatures uh, elevated temperatures for a very long time and of course the shock wave heating uh, which can be especially uh, important if we have highly porous rocks uh, and indeed, we do find it's actually pretty irritating if you are a geologist and you care more about rocks than about, you know, evil, um, evil organisms that are eating up your rocks uh, because they look uh, quite messy in the uh, under the microscope. But on the other hand, if you are an astrobiologist, uh, you really love those pieces uh, of, uh, of life that are being squeezed into or squeezing themselves into the different types of uh, impact rocks. Uh, you can see here uh, uh, 
images uh, of different uh, impact sites that have been eaten by uh, organisms. Uh, by the way, great paper by uh, Osinski et al. Uh, last year. Uh, I highly recommend it. I, I will have a list of, uh, of cool papers uh, later on uh, for you to check out. But why it seems that the uh, impact crater rocks impact types uh, are so tasty for microorganisms? Well, first of all, uh, usually uh, porosity of such rocks is higher than the um, surrounding rocks so there is just more space for those uh, first of all for the um, organism second of all for the water to circulate so there is space for them which is good for them um, however we need to remember that the, the porosity uh, that relation of porosity and the shock um, changing of rock, sh shock metamorphism of rock is quite complex. So for example, usually the uh, low porosity rocks, uh, basalts, uh, gnases, uh, and so on, uh, are increasing in porosity. However, the uh, rocks that have been quite porous, like the uh, sandstones, uh, can decrease the porosity quite uh, strongly. So, so it's a complex uh, situation, but in general, uh, porosity is increasing. Uh, second of all, there's plenty of glass usually uh, around, uh, especially larger impact craters, and glass has much higher, um, is able to be dissolved, uh, much higher dissolution rate than usual, uh, usual uh, minerals which means that it can be much easy, uh, easily eaten by the um uh, by the uh, microorganisms so a lot of glass is good um next thing is that the uh, impact craters are often uh, forming lakes uh, which again is a generally a nice uh, setting for life especially that it's uh, usually also associated with those uh, hydrothermal systems which means that uh, there is not only kind of normal lake but a lake with high um, um, heterogeneity of the environments from the chemical um, uh, point of view from the temperature point of view uh, and everything is is quite uh, condensed on small uh, space of, of this kind of crater so so that's good uh, and also uh, those uh, all those uh, features that I mentioned previously are forming a lot of different uh, alteration minerals which means that the um, there is a high variability of properties uh, that can be uh, chemical properties that can be uh, seen on very limited space. Uh, here you have you can see uh, recent uh, results of the modeling, numerical modeling that was done uh, for the um, reconstruction of uh, chick soup, so that one that killed dinosaurs, uh, hydrothermal systems, uh, and the um, you can see that the temperatures uh, were high, uh, highly variable from quite very high. Uh, this uh, this could have been uh, as high as, as more than 1,000 uh, degrees, a uh, large uh, zone with uh, impact melt, uh, up to a couple of hundred degrees uh, more than uh, surrounding uh, rocks. And this state uh, could have lasted for about million, maybe more than million of years. Um, within this time, a lot of rocks have changed their um, properties due to the interaction with water that was introduced into the subsurface because of the increased uh, porosity but also uh, because uh, of the uh, hydrothermal system that uh, induced the water circulation uh, that was very intense uh, and we also have something that is especially entertaining which is the lithopanspermia uh, which means that potential for moving a living organism from one place to another. And uh, of course, I'm not a biologist, so I will only uh, tackle the thing from the 
kind of geological perspective. Uh, and from that, the important parts of us is to check if we can, uh, if any organism can survive the ejection, the transfer and landing uh, on the surface of Earth um, or on the surface of Mars, for example. Uh, and the answer is yes, because we have meteorites from Mars uh, that uh, have survived uh, all those stages. If uh, the question is if any organisms that could potentially be within this rock could survive that. Uh, and this was, of course, che checked. So, uh, for example, here we have one of the uh, uh, experimental results uh, of the survi uh, survival rate of uh, some kind of organism uh, that was loaded onto the uh, rock and then shocked uh, experimentally. Uh, as you can see, obviously, uh, the organisms prefer not to be shocked. The higher the shock pressure, the lower the sur survival rate. However, as you can see, even in those really, really high uh, shock pressures, uh, we still have some organisms that are able to survive. So the, the point is that the survival uh, of the ejection of the uh, collision that is able to eject the material from the surface of one planetary body to another is possible. It's not easy, but it's possible. Uh, as for transfer and landing, there were also some experiments uh, that uh, that are being done, and um, we are sure the particles, the organisms are able to survive landing if the rock was large enough. Um, about the transfer, that the most biological question, because I guess uh, it's a most uh, that the largest problem is the uh, with the accumulation of the uh, deterioration of. Uh, of the organic matter and, and the uh, DNA or whatever those organisms could be using for, for DNA. Um, but in general, if we have large enough rock, it can be quite shielded uh, and it's within the you know middle zone of this rock. Uh, the, the organism could be potentially quite shielded from the uh, bad uh, influence of the space um, surroundings. Um, yeah. Okay, so we have already talked about impact and life, and uh, right now, quick uh, things about the impacts and death, which is much closer to my heart, as I already said. So if we would have an impact to the Earth that was about 1,000 kilometers in diameter, which is what was portrayed uh, in the movie, The Armageddon, uh, that would be a quite large event. Uh, it could create the impact crater that was about the size of the um, of Africa, uh, and even change the length of life uh, of uh, day, or depending on which direction it would hit. Uh, however, first of all, this kind of impact is very, very improbable because, uh, or improbable right now, it definitely happened in the past, in the very beginning of of our uh, solar system, but right now that there aren't many uh, objects of this size uh, that could uh, collide with us. So, so we should be safe from that. Uh, and it still probably wouldn't be enough to induce the impact sterilization of the entire planet. Uh, I'm not sure if you have, uh, if you are familiar with the idea of the late heavy bombardment. Uh, it's a proposed um, peak in the, um, in the impact rate uh, about uh, 4.1 to 3.8 billion of years ago that uh, was triggered by the uh, moving um, of the uh, large uh, planets uh, in the outer solar system that destabilized entire uh, all the smaller <laughs> planetary bodies uh, in the uh, and, and kind of created increased bombardment of the larger uh, of the inner solar system. So it either happened or it didn't, but still, if it had happened, it wouldn't be enough to uh, produce the full sterilization of, uh, of the air. Because the sterilization, full sterilization is really hard. So for example, if you have a plot of the 
uh, of the impact crater, quite large impact crater, you have uh, pieces of um, of rocks that would have probably be either sterilized or quite close to being just able to kill off all the living things, uh, especially very close to those um, suevite uh, pieces where the um, where there's a lot of melt uh, or in general like zones of impact melt um, would be sterilized. Uh, most probably most of the or large part of the rocks uh, in the inner part of the impact crater that have been af uh, affected by high intensity shock would die out but still it wouldn't be enough to kill off all of them so the impact sterilization would probably not work of course it would be deadly for more complex organisms but not for the microorganisms um, and even within those rocks that would be the most probable uh, rocks to, to be able to be sterilized, fully sterilized, uh, there are still maybe pieces like the, the piece of suevite you can see here, the uh, black part um, within these triangular rocks uh, are is actually pieces that, that have been melted. Uh, and between that, there's quite a lot of rocks that haven't been melted. Uh, down there also there might be some um, organisms that survived. So impact sterilization is really hard. Um, however, we know that the uh, impact of uh, just nine kilometers in diameter or 10 kilometers in diameter killed off our dinosaurs. How did it happen? Uh, important thing to, to remember is also that the uh, this is the only um, impact um, it's the only great uh, mass extinction that we know of that was caused by an impact crater. Uh, a lot of people have looked for a lot of other um, coincidences between the uh, age of crater and the great uh, mass extinction, but uh, till now nothing um, really clear was was found uh, that that could have produced such uh, deadly events. Uh, so the only one that was actually uh, caused by the, the only mass extension that was caused by uh, impact event was the uh, last one. Uh, how did it happen? Uh, well, here is like a uh, plot. Uh, that showing all the terrible things that could have happened uh, for to dinosaurs or any other organisms living uh, in the first day of Cenozoic. Uh, I highly recommend uh, reading this paper. It's not only informative but also uh, quite uh, entertaining. Um, so of course there could have been uh, some uh, gigantic tsunamis because the uh, impact that created Ch uh, Chick Slope uh, was formed at the um, shelf uh, of the continent. Uh, there uh, most definitely was a fireball that uh, have affected the um, organisms that were quite close to the uh, impact uh, point. Um, it might have also caused uh, other uh, fires uh, elsewhere all around the globe or it may not. This is still a matter of discussion. Uh, but the largest problem to the entire uh, Earth and the general reason why the dinosaurs died out was the long-lasting um, climatic uh, perturbations that have changed the system of the Earth uh, for quite a long time and caused it uh, to uh, be in, in a very uh, unstable state. Uh, the, and dinosaurs, especially the large, well, let's say the large dinosaurs, uh, did not survive that. However, uh, my particular specialization, as uh, Wolf uh, mentioned in the um, introduction, are small impact craters. So here you can see uh, results of of my studies. Uh, that are done within a small impact craters, uh, about 100 meters in diameter, that are the most commonly um, 
formed on the surface of Earth and one that we can actually expect to be formed within the next couple of hundred years, maybe less, I, I hope less. <laughs> um, so I have something to study. Um, you can see here, uh, we have a strong, uh, strong field, which means that the crater, uh, the, the asteroid that uh, was entering into the atmosphere was divided into smaller pieces, and all of them happened to hit the, the Earth in Estonia uh, in about the same time, uh, forming the largest of the impact craters, as you can see here, uh, about 100 meters in diameter, Karimane. The, uh, we have dug the uh, trench uh, in the uh, proximal ejecta of the uh, impact crater and we found dead bodies killed by this particular impact uh, event. Um, I am the most interested in those impact events, as I said, because they are the most common. And we should expect that this something like this was, will happen. So we should know what exactly are the environmental effects of those uh, events so that we can, for example, evacuate large enough uh, area uh, and do not let people turn into pieces of charcoal like those poor uh, trees did. Uh, all those charcoals are uh, spruce branches and all of them have, ki have been killed in the same moment. We know that because we, we can see the structure of the wood uh, in the charcoal uh, and we know that because we dated quite a lot of uh, pieces of those uh, woods uh, in the, uh, with C14. Uh, and based on the charcoal reflectance, we are able to figure out what was the conditions in which the charcoal have been formed. Uh, in short, very short, uh, the less reflective one <laughs> was formed in lower temperature than the more reflective one that was formed in higher temperature. There's a lot of more stuff to that. If you are interested, please talk to me. And here you have, you can see a plot of the reflectance on the x-axis and the center deviation within of the measurements within one particle um, of the of the charcoal. Uh, and the blue ones, uh, blue points are representing impact craters, and the red ones are representing the uh, forest fires, normal forest fires. As you can see, there is a large, uh, the, the impact crater uh, charcoal are formed uh, in low temperature and in very uh, consistent um, conditions. How, however, the normal, normally produced uh, impact charcoals, uh, full, normally produced wildfire charcoals are being formed in much higher temperatures and much um, higher variability of the conditions. Uh, interestingly, we have found similar things all over the world, including also uh, the, oh, not marked here, uh, white court in Canada. So all small impact craters are killing trees and potentially other organisms that may be around, I guess. So how did they die? Well, um, that's my working uh, hypothesis. We have an uh, incoming asteroid, uh, there's an uh, explosion that is forming an impact crater that is uh, also damaging the trees that are being uh, burned, um, covered by the ejecta, and then the, uh, they are slowly turning into the charcoal. Um, so not very nice death. I suggest no one tries that uh, at home, but if you do, uh, I will be very grateful to you for being able to study your charcoalized body. Uh, okay, and if you are interested uh, in more uh, information about this topic, please read preferentially all of the papers that are listed here, and I will be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, many thanks, Anja. So you can ask questions either by putting on your on your um, on your um, uh, um, um, screen. Uh, yes. Sorry, on the webcam, so that they can see it. And um, there is already one question here: Polystokes gets 
It was mm -hmm. said that asked, uh, I just had a question about the map of impact spots on the Earth that you showed. Why do you think mm -hmm. there are more impacts above the equator than below? Above the equator, I think, means in this case, north of the equator. Yes, that's a very good uh, observation. I'm just scrolling really quickly to the to the plot. <laughs> almost there, almost there. Okay, I'm here. Uh, well, uh, the most uh, correct but, but uh, kind of irritating answer is that there's more uh, geologists looking for impact craters uh, in the northern hemisphere. Um, so the unequal distribution of impact craters uh, on Earth is firstly related to the uh, location where you can find older rocks. So this is why you have more impact craters in the northern part of Europe than in the southern part of Europe, just because the northern part of Europe is uh, older than that. Second of all, it's related to how easy is it to find uh, impact crater. This is why within Africa, you have quite a lot of impact, even though it's more or less equally old. Um, you can see quite a lot of impact craters in the desert part of the uh, of the <laughs> continent, uh, then in the part that is covered by evil um, plants that are just, you know, uh, uh, covering all the beautiful rocks that we could study, uh, while a lot of those features uh, in the in the deserted part are are just quite obviously visible from the orbit event. So uh, so that's that's the thing. And the third thing uh, to consider is that, as I said, the number of people that are looking for those impact craters. So in the um, in US uh, there was first of all. For a very long time, a lot of people uh, interested in this topic because of the, you know, the, the first impact craters uh, have been uh, the, the impact cratering geology have been born in the United States, uh, and uh, second of all, there's a lot of geological maps that have been formed that have been created uh, in order to look for money. <laughs> uh, so, so in the same time it, they can be used to look for the impact craters. Hopefully I answered your question. Uh, the second question from uh, someone that is not uh, mentioned by name uh, is, uh, do you have uh, any experimental support for chakral reflectant uh, contra uh, temperature estimation? Of course I do, yes. Um, I hope to, to publish uh, the uh, the paper really quickly. There is, uh, oh, sorry, Martin. Hey, Martin, thanks again for, for your paper. Very interesting. <laughs> um, yes, I do. Um, and uh, if you want to talk some more about that, I will be happy to do that. But the, the thing is not published yet. Uh, but uh, yes, we did a lot of different experiments uh, on this topic. Are there any other questions or you know suggestions or I said something terrible about your topic that you love and you would like to make things straight? Just let me know. Okay, if you want to ask a question, either ask it in the chat or put on your camera, then I can see you, then you can ask. We unfortunately, unlike Zoom, we don't really have a um, any function for raising your hands, unfortunately. Well, seems that everybody is happy, no more questions. So thanks again, Anja. And could you stay on a little bit? I would like to talk to you a little bit. Of course. Yeah. Thanks, and if you have any questions later on, just drop me an email.